Um, is short, New Zealand is small. How should we tackle this threat? To debate these important questions, I am joined by Green spokesperson on climate change, James Shaw, and National spokesperson on climate change, Simon Watts, Tena Kora. Uh, let's get straight into it. Simon Watts, if National wins the election, you could be the climate change minister, right? How's the weight of that responsibility feel? Well, look, it's absolutely the reality that uh, in 51 days that could be the case. Uh, National have got a very strong uh, policy platform in regards to climate. We're absolutely committed in regards to emission reduction targets. Mm. Uh, and we're looking forward. Look, we need action in this space. And I think that's what most Kiwis are calling for. Uh, and that's and what do you feel the weight of that responsibility? This is a major, major portfolio. This is absolutely one of the significant, most significant aspects that is facing uh, our country and mm. actually more in a global environment as well. It's an economic considerations as much as it is uh, the environmental which we live, right. so yes. OK. James Shaw, obviously our current climate change minister. Wouldn't it be a relief to hand it over after six years? No, I'm very, very committed to finishing the job that I started uh, when I got into government in 2017. Um, I am very proud of the work that we've done over the course of the last six years, but we are only really just getting the momentum going, mm. uh, and I really do want to be here to ensure that okay. we, we continue that direction. All right. Well, let, let's focus on sort of where you have differing visions. The first one is the clean car discount. It's been very popular. It's been a big uptake. Simon Watts, would you still scrap that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we don't believe that taking, uh, you know, utes off farmers when they don't have an option to be able to transition to cleaner vehicles at the moment is the right thing. And, you know, the fact that we're paying, you know, uh, wealthy people to uh, subsidise buying them a Tesla mm. uh, is, with respect, uh, not... Uh, not. But what about the fun. emissions that have been reduced by the fact of this policy? Look, the reality is, is that the big car manufacturers are already producing EV vehicles. That's the direction of travel for the market. Uh, and, you mm. know, as I say, we don't think that we should be taxing uh, people that can't have any choice and then giving that money to people who so, can't afford it. All right, so it's gone. Uh, uh, James, um, he raises a point there. Has it been an elitist policy that has allowed Tesla owners to uh, get a good deal? 6,000 <coughs> Tesla wires, the most popular EV. This is a... A, an incredibly effective policy for bringing down emissions. It's actually bringing down emissions at two and a half times the top uh, scenario that we thought was, was going to happen. You know, before the clean car discount, one in 100 new cars sold in this country was an electric vehicle, one in 100, and in mm. the month of June it was one in two. But right? that, is, that is one of the most effective policies that we have had in the transport but space. But it doesn't for target those people who can't afford those top end cars. Well, that's why we also need to invest in public transport and active modes of walking, redesigning our cities so that we're getting around is easier, so that there's less congestion. Okay. So you're, you're happy with the policy and you want the market just to. To, to dictate what happens in the car. So. Well, actually, look, 40% of our emission profile comes from energy and transport. We've mm. got a policy around Electrify New Zealand, which enables us to transition off fossil fuel transport onto electrification. That is the means, that is the action that we need to take in order to reduce right. emissions, and that's what our policy is right. focused on. I'm going to, seeing as we're talking about roads, I'm going to introduce our first question. Um, this is from School Strike for Climate's Aurora Garner Randolph, and it's on Nationals' roading policy. Why on earth, in a climate crisis, is your party prioritising roads of national significance when what would benefit ordinary New Zealanders is actually investment into passenger rail and investment into free public transport? So how do you respond to that, Simon? Well, with respect, buses and EVs drive on roads. So mm. I think it's completely... Uh, a logical argument to say that we don't need roads because the reality is as we transition off fossil fuel buses to green and hydrogen, we transition off fossil fuel cars to electric, mm. they're going to need roads to drive So, so your, your, your vision of public transport is, is buses? That's right, we've, because we've, you don't talk about rail and light rail. No, look, we've got elements of that in our transport policy, but we are very much supportive around uh, bus uh, mass rapid transit as a mechanism in order to uh, reduce congestion and reduce emissions, particularly in our urban oh, centres. So, James, obviously public transport is a key part of the Green Party policy, um, yeah, look, but, you know, but you know, buses obviously do need roads. They do, but there's not a city in the world where adding one more lane of traffic <clears> has ever solved the congestion problem, right? You have something called induced demand, where the more roads you build, the more traffic that you get, uh, and then you respond by building yet more roads, right? If you actually want to reduce congestion and reduce emissions, you actually have to get people into the most effective and efficient way of moving them around in between our cities, mm. uh, and that is with uh, rap you know, rapid transit uh, uh, modes as well. And that actually alleviates road space for people who do need to use those roads. Yeah, so that's, 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 James, that's a key point. Um, there. If you look at Singapore, the Netherlands, the top five countries in the globe that have the best uh, transport and roading networks, they've also reduced emissions. Yeah, so the argument to say that 
you know, that roads are a, are a barrier to reducing emissions. This is simply not thank free. Thank you, yes, I do, actually. Thank you for raising Singapore and the Netherlands because they have higher petrol taxes than we do. They have higher charges than we do in the uh, clean car discount. Um, they have road user charges as well. They actually, and if you want to talk about driving as an elitist uh, activity, in Singapore, very, very few people drive on the roads that they have. The reason why they have such good roads is because so, pe so few people use them. We crowd everybody onto our roads and we get them driving around in the heaviest vehicles available. It is, that okay. is why our roads are in such bad shape. Right, OK. Well, well, there's a clear differentiation there. I'm going to move on to our next topic, though, um, just because we've got so much to get through. Let's talk our favourite one, agricultural emissions, methane gas from cows and sheep. Um, we've got a question here from Federated Farmers uh, President Wayne Langford. Yeah, we think the methane targets need to be reviewed. Uh, methane targets need to be scientific-based, need to be achievable and they need to be practical in a way that farmers can, uh, can achieve them over time. Right, so James, that's aimed at you. Should the methane targets be reviewed? Uh, actually, the Climate Change Commission are reviewing all of our targets next year. That's in the primary legislation. But having <coughs> when, when Wayne says that they want to be science-based, our targets are currently weaker than what the science suggests that they, that they should be. Right, so you would say that if they are reviewed, they'd actually get a bit tougher. Yeah, well, if you were to review it from the science, then given that methane is an incredibly powerful short-term gas and we are up against the clock in terms of mm. needing to constrain global uh, warming, um, I would say uh, to Federated Farmers, you should be very careful what you wish for because over a five-year period, methane, or over a 20-year period, methane's 86 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. Oh, all right, Simon, what's I want your position on this, on the yeah. methane targets that Federated Farmers once reviewed and they want them probably reduced, don't they? Look, absolutely, and our policy that we've released around agricultural emissions actually dictates and says that we will be reviewing those in 2024. We've just heard comments from a minister that as part of the government released its fourth version of agricultural emissions policy yesterday, mm -hmm. of which the minister doesn't even agree with the government's policy. Well, that's true. So, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. that's, this that's, is a bit that's, of that's, shambles I don't, with, with I, don't, I don't agree with that policy because it doesn't guarantee that we'll reduce emissions. Your agricultural policy is to defer action by another seven years to the year 2030, and that has been your policy since the year 2000 hmm. is to kick it down the road and kick it down the road. Yeah, it's not simply not true. You know, we have well, introduced biotechnology uh, in regards to that. Your party on, has actually okay. blocked a number of that innovative uh, stuff over the last 20 okay, years. OK, I'm, going to, I'm going to just going to break this down a little bit. There's a bit to go through here. National has pushed back to 2030 the idea of farmers paying for emissions. Where is, is, where is the urgency from, from National on this? Well, we've said within our policy that the, the first thing off the cab is providing farmers with the tools in order to be able to reduce their emissions. So is the, problem said, with, yeah, but is the problem with that that the tools aren't here and you can't guarantee that yeah, the tools well, will be here by 2030? With respect to the Green Party, they've actually been uh, campaigning against um, a lot of biotechnology and GE uh, aspect over the last 20 years. Tools in which could help assist our agricultural sector and that is, to that reduce is... emissions. We've said get rid of that red tape yep. now. The government's had six years to do that. They haven't And done. that is a good point, They're James Shaw. I mean, you have not, you have been blocking anything on GMO. No, we no, what do you have. mean you haven't? Then well, is the, uh, what is the Green Party policy on GMO in terms of, like, agricultural emissions? Well, it's, it's to apply the precautionary principle. If, I mean, what Simon's talking about here is, uh, is, is ryegrass. Yeah. Um, and, and the G ryegrass, even in the lab, is unproven. If you want it, you know, and, and look, you can make what, a sign... What, isn't can, there an example of countries around the world using this kind of ryegrass and this kind of technology? Uh, no, not out in the field yet. There are, there are tests going on. Uh, there are tests going on in labs here. There's tests going on in the mm. field in the United States. The results of those are pretty inconclusive at the moment. But if you wanted to look at our track record, the, this government has poured almost half a billion dollars uh, into R&D and into incentives and in working with industry. And uh, that's on top uh, of $200 million uh, that was spent over the preceding So you're saying it's years. not really the national saying... No, no, well, no, sorry, what I what say I'm what saying is, is if you want to wait around for a silver bullet, rather than focus on the solutions that we know work right now when we're up against the clock and we are in a climate, climate emergency, kicking the can down the road and saying that we will wait to... Okay. until that there is so, some kind so, of right, scientific so silver bullet. This is a $40 yeah. billion dollar industry, James, and with respect, your policy yesterday will decimate 20% of lamb and beef farms. Well, that's not James' that policy. Not James doesn't agree with that one. That is not a sustainable <laughs> mechanism for our broader economy, uh, and we need a much more pragmatic and sensible policy, and we've got a pathway to get there. Can I, okay, can it's I just the same talk... pathway you've been on for the last 30 years, Okay. Just the can down the road. All right, let's just talk... Uh, let's talk about that particular policy. Hewaka Ekonoa was supposed to be a 
world first, the first to price in agricultural emissions. There's been no agreement on it, um, and now as climate change minister, you don't agree with Labor's latest position. It seems like a real mess. Well, I, I, look, I would agree. I mean, the, the, the problem that you've got is that in leaving the industry to develop a system, they focused on developing on, on consensus between the industry players rather than on something that was effective. My objection is that we should actually um, price it on the same principle mm. that we price everything else in the economy, right. which is that you place an absolute cap on emissions, you reduce it incrementally over time, you allow farmers to trade with each other in order to say those who are the most innovative can get something out of it and th those who need to... Okay, so that's, that, that is your speak, policy. Go, go All right. Way. Okay, and we've talked about your policy. Look, I'm just going to move on uh, quickly. There's one, one, one piece of criticism out this week, Simon, is that National has not actually calculated the emissions reductions of any of its policies. Is that right up. or wrong? Well, look, transport is, and energy is 40%. Our policy around electrifying New Zealand says that we can mm. uh, significantly reduce that by a third. Mm. When you get into the agricultural space, yes, when you introduce innovation in order to reduce emissions, we don't have all the answers to how much that will reduce. Right, so isn't but, that the problem? <laughs> well, but it is the problem, but it's not a problem that's unique to New Zealand. This is an international problem around how we solve the reduction in methane uh, for agriculture globally. Right, so New Zealand can and should have the opportunity so to lead on coming up with some of those answers. Okay, all right, look, I'm, I'm going to move on. Um, I think I'm just going to move on to... Uh, climate adaptation, because we've got so many things to get through. Mm. Um, climate adaptation and managed retreat. There was an interesting government working group out this week, and it came up with an interesting compensation model, and that is that if you are forced to move by climate change, there is compensation if you own a house, if you own a, uh, a business, if you're a landlord, but if you have a batch, there is no compensation for you. James, do you agree with that model? What we've uh, done is we've said... Um, we're going to set up a, a special select committee um, which will then draft legislation uh, and that select committee will have the opportunity to respond to all of the recommendations that are in that expert working group right. report. Right. So OK, so you, you, it's not a yes or a no. No, it's, it's not. I, I actually want to see... I, I, this is one of those massive challenges that we've got to face over many decades, several changes of government. It's really important that on this point we have parliamentary consensus. Yep. And so regardless of what my personal views are about any of those recommendations, I do want that select committee to come to a okay. view before we draft the legislation. Right. Simon, just a, a brief response on that Look, kind of the proposal. reality is uh, the government has sat on its hands for the last six years in order to put in place a national framework that can answer that exact question. Mm. That is simply not good enough So you're not supportive of what James is we saying? We are supportive that we need to move with absolute pace. And I guess the frustration is the government's had six years to do this and mm. they've just kicked off something two weeks before Parliament rises. Okay. And, you know, the events of weather events in Auckland nearly seven months ago, including in my home electorate and my home as well, are real, right? And yeah. we need a framework at a national level that includes levels of government, well, uh, banks and insurers to come up with the answers to the question you asked. Alright, well that's going to have to happen in the next term of Parliament, whoever is in power. I want to talk about the cost to the consumer of, car, uh, of carbon tax. So there's taxes on our petrol and our gas. Should the money raised from that go strictly into climate initiatives or should some of it be returned to us to ease that cost of living with a carbon dividend? What do you think, Simon? Look, we're absolutely supportive that uh, elements of that uh, ETS are distributed out to households uh, because I think the reality is, is that it's simple and pragmatic. It's a tax on pollution. Uh, and, you know, at the moment we've got a cost of living crisis. Mm. We've got people that are really struggling. Uh, and the concept of, of a carbon dividend uh, is something that we... We are supportive. What about you, James? Yeah, we're supportive of it as well, and I've right. got a work program to um, investigate the extent to which uh, the increases in the cost of carbon affect households disproportionately. So we are we are working on that. Having said that, the solution here is to get households off fossil fuels, right? So you know, the Greens uh, released so our policy a few weeks ago, which is to. Um, help households to electrify at home to get rid of With the solar gas panels connections and, and all those so things, on and yeah. so forth because yeah. that does two things. It gets you off fossil fuels and it brings okay. down your household power bills. All right, but, but there seems to be some consensus don't forget, on that. National introduced warming up homes policy, 241,000 homes that we put insulation into. So again, we've got track record okay. uh, and delivery in that space. All right, well. I'm I have to move on because it's about the election. This particular carbon dividend is also a policy of ACT, right? So Simon, I just wonder if, if ACT comes along and says we want the carbon dividend but they want to scrap almost everything else like carbon zero act and all those kinds of things what 
will you concede to get a coalition with ACT? Well, look, National are absolutely committed to our emission reduction targets. I'm not the leader, so I won't be negotiating uh, the coalition uh, agreements around And so that. you're committed to, to the Net Zero Carbon Act as well? Absolutely, and yeah. actually so is uh, members of the ACT Party when we had a bill in front of the no, House this not. week when Simon well, Court in committee stage, and you were sitting in the chair, James, said yeah. that we support their, Net Zero. Their policy is to uh, uh, repeal the Zero Carbon Act, to uh, disestablish the Climate Change well, Commission. that's not what they said in committee this week. That is, that is their policy on their website. It is well, scrapping all of those things. Have a good hand side this week when you're in the chair. Well, okay. coherent on this point. Yeah. Okay. Look, it, it all feels a bit doom and gloom and a bit, you know, we're all in a really bad situation. I did, there's one more person I want to hear from. This is Mike Smith. He's the Climate Resilience Organiser from the EWE Chairs Forum. Let's have a listen. Climate change doesn't have to be a negative totally. This is an opportunity for us to, to change the settings, uh, to change our systems and to be transformative and um, have a culture and paradox shift that's so desperately needed. Right, so um, an opportunity, Simon Watts. Would you agree with Mike Smith there? Oh, I absolutely do. You know, the reality is, is we need to take action in order to meet our emission reduction targets. National are committed to do that, and we have a clear plan to do that. And in respect of working in a bipartisan manner, mm. uh, National has, uh, throughout the actions that we've taken in the past, done that in a way in which is constructive, uh, and we continue to do so. Right, OK. James, I mean, you've been overseeing the catastrophe. Is there an opportunity as well? Yes. And I don't I, mean personally, by no, the way. No, no, no. <laughs> I know. Look, I, I, I say this all the time, that if you actually focus on the solutions, they, uh, you know, like the clean car discount, like putting solar panels on people's roofs and insulating their homes and so on and so forth, you, you see economic benefits, you see health benefits, mm. you see people's household power bills come down. All of those things actually lead to a better quality of life and lower living costs and less inflation than we have Can we moment. agree on the urgency in this, Simon? Can we agree? On the Absolutely, yep. we need a step change in the pace of the action to, that required in order to reduce. Right, and, and you obviously feel the same way, James. Sure. I do, and, and and I'm very pleased that National have uh, signed up to the Zero Carbon Act and those long-term targets. But every single policy that we have put in place to do anything about the crisis, they have voted against. Okay, well, after this election, can you both guarantee whoever is in power a sense of bipartisanship over this issue? Absolutely. I will always work across Parliament to try and ensure that we actually get the um, action that we need. Okay. That's the end of our debate. Uh, James Shaw, thank you so much for your time. Simon Watts, thank you so much for your time.